Let us pray. Father, here we are standing before you now. And first of all, we just say thank you, Lord. You are an awesome God, Lord. You are a mighty God. You are all powerful. And most importantly, you are loving God. We thank you because you love even us. And we truly thank you for that. Now, Lord, as we prepare to hear a word from you today, speak to us, Lord, and through us. Send us a divine word from your throne. And Lord, I pray that you will write it in our hearts that we might not sin against thee. Bless those that will hear, those that will receive, and those that will believe your word today. In the blessed and holy and righteous name of Jesus our Lord, we pray. Let the people of God say amen. 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 Briefly, I invite your attention to the book of Psalms, Division 78. Psalms, Division 78. And we're going to focus on verses 40, 41, and 42. Psalms, Division 78, verses 40, 41, and 42. Amen. Hear ye, hear ye the word of the Lord. How oft did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They remembered not his hand, nor the day when he delivered them from their enemy, from the enemy. I want to focus on verse 41. Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Our topic today for your consideration is don't limit God. Amen. Don't limit God. What? Turn to your neighbor and just tell your neighbor, look, look friend, look neighbor, look brother, look sister, don't limit God. Don't limit God. You may be seated in the presence of our Lord and our Savior. It's a blessing to be able to stand before you today. Uh, we've had a long week, but it's been a blessed week. And I thank God for that. As we look at the book of Psalms, Division 78, it, it, there's some question. Let's see if we can get this microphone to cooperate with us here. There's a question as to who actually wrote Psalm 78. Some say that Asaph wrote it. Others say that Isaiah wrote it. I kind of lean towards Isaiah because of the history that is contained in the book, that the division uh, 78 of Psalms. The whole Psalm is a story that's being told, and this story is about the history of Israel, the people of God, and it goes all the way down to the time of David. It tells us that God was good to his people, just like God is good to us today. Amen. Amen. This particular book tells us, this particular psalm tells us that God was good to his people and the people were not good to God. That sound like us too, don't it? Oh, I, I knew I wouldn't get very many amens to that. Amen. But it's the truth. It's the truth. And sometimes the truth hurts. Amen. And if it hits you today, just say ouch and amen. Amen. Ouch and amen. <laughs> they did not obey God and that broke God's heart. And, and, and that is a problem that we even face today. God is good to us, but we are not always good to God. You see, we have a tendency to forget the things that God has done for us. How, how he blessed us when we were sick. How he gave us a job when we were unemployed. How he provided a ride for us when we were on our feet. We forget all of those things after we get the blessing and then we begin to disappoint God. It's still true today and it was true in those days as well. In Psalm 78, we find 
that this particular psalm is broken down into four divisions. The first part of it is calling the people's attention back to God. Amen. Amen. And you know, that's what we need to do today. This world, this United States of America and, and the world at broad, we need to be called back to God. We've strayed away. We've gotten away from the principles and precepts of the Lord and, and, and we have even turned back to things that we had said we were going to let go. All right. Come on. The next portion of this particular division lets us know about the history of Israel. It tells us about how God brought them out of Egypt and, and how he took them through the Red Sea and, and, and through the desert and brought them to Canaan. And, and, and it lets us know that God did it for them and he can do it for us. Uh, it talks about their settlement in Canaan. Isn't it wonderful when you finally get home? Yeah. And isn't that wonderful? You know, you, you can travel all over this world, but it's just something about being home. And God had promised that Canaan would be their home. And the final part of this division of Psalms lets us know that the mercies of God to Israel contrasted with their ingratitude. In other words, it lets us know that even though God was good to them, they were not good to God. You know, as we look at that 41st verse in Psalm 78, we find that the word limited is used there. It says, and limited the Holy One of Israel. That word limited comes from the Hebrew word Tava. Would you say that? Tava. And Tava means to grieve. Have you ever had somebody to just grieve your spirit? You know, they may have done something to you or you might see that they are going in the wrong direction. No matter how much you try to help them to see the error of their ways. And God, as he looked at Israel, he became grieved over Israel because they chose to disobey God rather than to obey and serve him. No matter what he gave them, no matter how many times he delivered them, no matter, no matter how many ways he made for them, they still chose to turn back and go a different way. You see, our text today refers to a situation that had developed and they were right there at the verge of the blessing that yeah, God. Y'all, yeah, yeah. y'all pray with me now. I, I'm not going to be long, but sometimes we are right at the verge yeah. of our breakthrough. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I remember a situation. It was a story told and my mother told me this story some years ago, a few years ago. I won't say how many years ago, but it was a long time ago. Amen. My mother told me this story about this man that was traveling and he was lost traveling at night and he was lost and he couldn't seem to find his way. And he followed the maps that to the best of his ability, but he still got lost and he was traveling and traveling in the thick of night and, and he really couldn't tell where he was and the place that he was going to seemed to be so far and so distant. And what he decided to do is that he had gone so far and he didn't know where he was that he turned around and went back the other way. The next day when it was daylight, he decided to start on that trip again. And while he was traveling, he recognized the point where he turned around. And lo and behold, as he went just a mile farther, the destination that he was trying to get to all the time was right there. He was right at the verge of reaching his destination, but instead he went back the other way. Why am I telling you that story? Because so many of us 
are right on the verge of the breakthrough and the blessing that God has for us. But because we can't see, you see, some things we are not going to see. Our eyes don't see like God's eyes sees. God's eyes see the past, he sees the present, and he sees the future. He sees where you've been and what you've been doing. He knows and sees what you're doing right now. And he sees what you can do if you just keep on pressing on in his holy name. This man was right there where he was trying to get, yet he turned around and he delayed his arrival at his destination. Turning point. Don't delay your arrival at the destination. Don't delay your arrival. It's just ahead if you just keep trusting God and press forward. I'm going to try to stick to my script, but the, the, the people of God had come to the very place that God had promised them they would go. They were right there at Canaan, the place that God had promised them. And when they got there, they decided that they would send in spies to check out Canaan yeah. to make sure that they would be able to inhabit Canaan. And you know the story how they chose spies and they went in. And all of the spies went in and they realized that these Canaanites were some big and ferocious and well-armed folk. And when they checked out the people of Canaan, mm -hmm. the word lets us know that 10 of the spies came back. Yeah. The word even says that they had an evil report uh -huh. because they came back and they said, oh, we cannot take Canaan. Those people are like giants. Yeah. And can you see the enemy will magnify stuff. Uh -huh. He will magnify yeah. stuff in your sight. When you're trusting your own flesh and you're trusting your own vision and you're trusting your own way of thinking and, and working things out, the enemy will magnify the molehills that are in front of you and make them seem like they are great gigantic mountains. And they came back and they came back with an evil report. But let me tell you what they also did. They didn't only bring back a report that was negative but then they began to stir up rumors among the people of God and they came and made them turn against Moses and his leaders. Hello, somebody. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? And there were two spies, however, that went over, and isn't it amazing how people can look at a situation and depend, depending on the eyes that they are looking through, they come back with a different report. <laughs> and, 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 and those 10 spies came back and said, no, we can't take Canaan. But Joshua and Caleb came back and said, the land is ours. Let's go and conquer the land. You see, Joshua and Caleb wasn't just looking at what their physical eyes see, saw. They were looking at what the word of God had said and God had promised them that they would possess Canaan. Turning point, we got to remember that God has given us a word and, and, and if we trust in the Lord, his promises will be made true. We serve a God that's able to keep his word. And that's why I challenge you today, don't limit God. Don't limit God. So many times God has delivered you and you know he did. You know he did. You know he did. You know he did. Israel had no doubt that God had delivered them. They were in Egypt and God sent 10 plagues and, and convinced Pharaoh that he better let my people go. They were in the desert and didn't have anything to eat. God fed, fed them with manna from heaven. Led them by a fire at night and a pillar of cloud during the day. The clothes didn't even wear out. You can buy something now and it'd be towed up tomorrow. <laughs> Think about it, 40 years, and the clothes didn't wear out. Right. Then when they made their way to Canaan, 
when they were there at the brink of their breakthrough, they decided that they would not trust God, the one that had done all of those things for them. They decided they would not trust them. First Corinthians 10, nine through 11 says, neither let us tempt Christ. As some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these happen unto them for examples, and they are written of for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Then in Romans 15, 4, the Bible says, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. I want to tell you today, not, you, you will not face anything in this life that the word of God does not address. I dare you to find something that you're going through that God's word has not already dealt with. And we check the word out because in the word we find hope. I know that sometimes it, it seems like all hope is lost and, and that's all right, but don't give up your faith and trust in God, but continue to trust him to work it out and I guarantee you my God will. Now, it seems like a paradox that the psalmist would use the phrase that they limited God. How in the world can we limit God? God is awesome. God is all powerful. God is all knowing. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. God is, is, is greater than anything that we can ever be. But yet we have the capability of limiting God. How can that be? Oh, help us, Holy Ghost. You see, God made us a free agent. God created us. Created us with the ability to choose whether to serve him or not. Choose to live or die. Choose to uh, walk upright or to walk in sin. Isaiah 1 19 lets us know that we must be willing and obedient. Revelation 22 17 lets us know that the word says whosoever will. See God doesn't do anything against our will. Are y'all hearing me today? God wants us to live holy and he wants us to live righteous but he ain't going to make us do nothing. It's up to us. We have to decide that we want to honor God in our lives and, and, and the things that we do and even the things that we don't do. The fact remains and history shows that men do limit God and they set bounds for him and it make it impossible for him to help them. Y'all listen carefully now to what I'm about to say. You see, limiting God means that we put God in a position where he won't have the desire to help us. Have you ever had somebody that just offended you to the point that you just got fed up with them? And you decided that, okay, I don't want to hear it. Talk to my hand, because I I, I, I'm just tuning you out now. And that's what happens when we limit God, when we have turned back so many times from doing the will of God and keeping the promises that we make to God, when we turn back from doing those things and we do it over and over and over again, God gets to the point where we grieve him. And he then loses the desire to even help us. Where would we be if God stopped helping us? 
Oh, there'd be a lot of foreclosures on houses if God did that. There'd be a lot of cars being repossessed if God did that. But not only that, there'd be a lot of folk that are not in the hospital that will be in the hospital because God decided to take his hand off your body. And oh Lord, don't let him take his hand off your mind. Yo, you think you crazy now. Uh, I, I kind of think some of you are crazy now too. <laughs> but let God take his hand off of our minds and we'll be everlasting crazy. Y'all don't hear me today. And when we grieve God, when we turn away from God like Israel did time and time and time again, God loses the desire to help us. You have a need. Let me tell you how God works sometimes, Brother Eli Eliezer. Sometimes you have a need. Your particular need you have, and you're crying out to God. And you're saying, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to make it through this situation. But I'm trusting you, Lord, because you said that you, you, in your word that your, 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 your seed have never been forsaken, nor begging bread. That's what you said, Lord. So I'm just putting your word back on you, Lord. And you don't know how that thing is going to get worked out. Then the very blessing that you need, God takes it. And Deacon Franklin winds up with that breath, that blessing. <laughs> Deacon, now he's, got the, he's the one that got what you need. You don't even know him. But somehow God brings the two of you together. And when Deacon Franklin is hearing the word of God and the voice of God, and you are lined up with the word of God, Deacon Franklin will recognize that the Spirit is saying, bless this brother. And the very, y'all don't hear me today. And the very thing that you need, Deacon Franklin provides it because both of you are joined together in the Spirit of God. That's the way the body of Christ is supposed to work. If you have a need and God has blessed me with it, I am supposed to be able to bless you. Some of us get all excited when God, oh, I got a, I got a hundred dollars. I found a hundred dollars on the payment. Thank you, Lord. Bless the Lord. And we shout all over the place. And then we run down to Walmart because we anxious to spend that hundred dollars. But we didn't realize that you were supposed to be a channel of blessings to bless somebody else. Amen. Oh, yeah. You got a job. You've been looking for a job a long time. You got a job and, and the door is open for you and you find favor on that job. And you forget all of your brothers and sisters out there that are looking for jobs too. You won't put a word in for them because you're just so, so tied up and wrapped up in trying to keep your job yourself. But don't you know the more you give, the more you receive. That's the way it works. That's the way it works. God blesses us and he opened doors for us to help others to come through it. Amen. Amen. Oh, y'all don't like this word today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. And, and, and God is waiting for us to stop limiting him. So how do we limit the Holy One in Israel? Well, I want to sh share with you four ways that we limit the Holy One in Israel. Uh, we limit... God by our unbelief. I talked about in Numbers 14 how the spies brought back that account. It was an evil account. And because they brought back a report that stirred up the people to distrust God, the word says that some 23,000 people died at the hand of God. God got fed up with them, not trusting him. Look, I brought you out of Egypt. Look, I fed you in the desert. Look, I brought you through the Red Sea. And, and, and this is what I get. 
I'm told you that I'm going to give you Canaan and you're doubting what I said. And he let them die. He let them die. I don't know about you, but I don't want God to let me die. If it's in his will, I want him to bless me. I'd rather line up on the blessing side. But they, they, were, they disbelieved God. They were disobedient to God. Uh, Hebrews 4, 1 through 11 lets us know that God has set out to take Israel into the promised land, but the majority of these people disobeyed the Lord and rejected his promise and rebelled against him. The next thing they did was not only were they disobedient, but they rejected him. John 1, 10 through 12 lets us know that they crucified our Lord. They nailed him to a tree. They speared him in the side, put a crown of thorns on his head, buried him in a borrowed tomb. They rejected Jesus. And when we reject the Son of God, when we reject salvation through the Son, the Lamb of God, we limit God. For Jesus himself said that I am the way and no man comes to the Father but by me. If you reject Jesus, you are limiting God's ability to save you. Y'all hear me well. James 4, 2 and 3 lets us know that, that they limit God by neg neg negligence. That they limit God simply because they won't ask. James said, you have not. Because you what? Because you ask not. Because you ask not. And you must ask with faith, not wavering. But with all trust and belief and faith in the power of God, not only to hear your prayer, but to answer your prayer. And when we won't ask God, we are limiting God's ability to help us. And Revelation 3, 14 through 17 tells us something else. It tells us about a church named Laodicea. The Laodiceans were a church that did well as far as man's standards were concerned. And they felt that because they had nice chariots to ride in and nice uh, uh, abodes to live in, that they had the finest things of life in that day and time, that they didn't need anything. They measured their spiritual worth and value with their material things. That's not like us today, is it? I pray that it's not. And, and they, they were a church that did not understand that they were spiritually bankrupt. God even said that I can't stand you, Laodicea, because you are not hot, and you are not cold. You are lukewarm. Yeah, let me tell you about a lukewarm church. Come on. <laughs> Joshua, a lukewarm church is a church where yeah, the, the Holy Spirit is there. And he's trying to get people to move and to respond to his presence. But the church is so sedity and so stuck up and so stuck on themselves that they can't give God a praise and, and glorify his holy name. Oh, don't ask them to raise their hands and stand up and, and say amen because they are too dignified for that. But God is saying, look. I can't stand you. I have blessed you. I have taken care of you. I have brought you through all of the things that you have gone through. And you won't worship me. And you won't praise me. Say, <laughs> so because you are lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Spew you out. And when we are lukewarm, we limit God's ability to help us. You know, I've decided and made up my mind that I will not 
limit God. I will not limit God. You see, God is able. Anybody know that he's an able God? If God tells me that he's gonna move a mountain, I am just gonna trust that that mountain shall be removed. And some of us got mountains right now that we are up against, that we are facing. And because we won't trust God, that mountain continues to stand right there. But I invite you to join me today and trust our able God and believe that no matter what the situation, no matter what the burden is that you carry, no matter what you're going through, that our God is able. Can I get at least one witness today? Our God is able. He's able to heal. He's able to deliver. He's able to make a way. He's able to bless you on that job. He's able to bless you in whatever way you need. And most important, he's able to take a wretch like me and a wretch like you and save us, clean us up. My God is able. My God is able. And because I know he's an able God, you know, God doesn't have to do another thing for me because he's already done more than he had to do. When I think about that cross where he allowed his son to be crucified and he died and he was buried for my sins, not for anything that he had done, but for my sins. I realize that this God is worthy of my trust, worthy of my obedience, worthy of my loyalty, worthy of my efforts, my work, whatever I can do, Lord, you are worthy. And the wonderful thing about it is that no matter how we labor and how we strive and how we, we, we seek to, to, to serve the Lord, we can't do enough to justify what he did for us. We're all like filthy rags when we stand before God. But he has a Holy Ghost laundromat. <laughs> he has a Holy Ghost laundromat where he can clean us up. And we've got to go through all the cycles go through the wash cycle go through the rinse cycle wash in the blood of the lamb agitated by the Holy Ghost oh yes yeah, see if you don't agitate that dirt is just gonna stay there that's why God has to purge us and, and he allows trials and tests to come our way. He's agitating our spirit so that those impurities and those impediments will come out of our spirit. He's working us. He's working us. Working it out. And then, I don't know many of us that would let our laundry go into the washing machine and go through all those cycles and then leave it in the washing machine but you got to take it out and put it in the dryer and see some of us are in the drying phase right now See, well, when it dries, when something dries, that, that means that all of the other things are, are, are being evaporated out of there, the water, the, the moisture and all of that. And sometimes we go through dry spells. David knew what he was talking about when he was talking about how it seemed like he couldn't hear God's voice and he was in a dry place in his relationship with God and he was longing for the voice of God, but it seemed like God wasn't talking to him. God wouldn't say anything. He was in the dryer and I want you to know that God will put us in the dryer and, and in that time we've got to lean and depend on the faith and the trust that we have through his word. But oh, when that buzzer rings <laughs> and you finish that cycle, are any of y'all going to stay in the dryer till the cycle finishes? I, 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 is anybody going to stay in until the cycle finishes? Because 
move and let cycle finish this baby sister oh hallelujah we come out new creatures new creatures new creatures new creatures new creatures God knows the cycles that we need to go through to clean us up and I will not limit God's ability to work in my life it is my prayer that you my brothers and my sisters will trust God not limit God and remember that God is able.